Boxer Benny Lynch has been both a national hero and a tragic figure in this country's recent history. BBC One Scotland sorts out fact from fiction now in excess. Benny Lynch was a superstar. He was tough, he was quick, he was brave, and he took on everyone. When the gong went, Benny Lynch went, <laughs> bang, bang, whoop, and smashed the American to the floor, unconscious, just like that. He was a wonderful boxer. I only wish he had the brain to act outside the ring as it did inside. Inside he was perfect. Outside he was a damn nuisance. He won the title at 22. 100,000 people came to see him in, in Glasgow when he arrived back. And yet he died on the street with nothing. How in hell did that happen? More than 60 years after becoming Scotland's world boxing champion and more than 50 years after his tragic early death at the age of 33, Benny Lynch is worshipped still in boxing circles and remains fresh in the minds of those who saw him box. A sporting legend and a potent Scottish icon. But it's not only boxers who keep the Benny Lynch flame alive. A life marked in equal measure by greatness and tragedy has attracted many a biographer, all of whom have attempted to reconcile Lynch's talent in the ring with his alcoholism outside it. Now in the pipeline, there is a major film about Lynch starring Robert Carlyle. Anybody who, 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 who knows anything about Benny will know what a, an amazing story. He's Scotland's first world champion, <coughs> flyweight champion boxer. Uh, he was dead at the age of 32. So it's a kind of rags to riches to rags story. Well, I had written Looking After Jojo, and uh, on the set, Bobby and I were talking about, um, you know, possible films, and he said he'd always wanted to, to play Benny Lynch. And um, so I began researching the story, and um, the more I looked into it, the more compelling it became to me. But the idea of committing Lynch's life to celluloid is nothing new. 40 years ago, Norman Wisdom saw huge potential in Lynch's life story. It was such a sad story and a wonderful story. He was such a successful fighter, and yet it was such a sad story in a life, you know, drinking and uh, ruined his career. Although Norman Wisdom had boxed for the army, he couldn't persuade his producers to cast him in a serious role. I wasn't at all surprised that they said no. Of course, they looked upon me as a comedian, and that was it. Even for a person who wasn't even interested in boxing, it was a lovely... Drama dra dramatic storyline and sporting one, yes. And anybody who didn't watch the film and enjoy it must have been mental. I wish I'd done it. <laughs> they didn't let me do it. And now I'm too old. <laughs> Benny Lynch was already Scottish champion by the time he travelled to Manchester to fight for the World Flyweight Championship in September 1935. A successful boxer when he left Glasgow, his star was about to burn even brighter and a rise to fame unprecedented for the time. Even the most optimistic never imagined the result that Lynch achieved the night he fought Jackie Brown. The big fight at Manchester is on. Lynch, the slighter man with everything to win, Brown with curly hair defending his three flyweight titles, world, European and British. Brown is very confident, but Lynch, the former Glasgow messenger boy, is only waiting an opportunity to get in a powerful punch, and there it goes. Brown is quickly up again, but Lynch sends him to the boards four more times in the first round. Watch his left hook. In the second round, Lynch goes on hitting and Brown goes on falling. Five more times he goes down. You have to put your opponent down ten times in the space of two rounds before the referee finally has to intervene is quite an achievement. We were fighting at world-class level, as he was. Brown is battered and groggy. The Manchester boxer is dethroned, and the referee stops the fight. Being a world champion in those days uh, meant a great deal more, and because there were less of them to win, 
and are much more difficult and much more opponents to beat. Also, there were only eight champions, so a world champion had, had uh, uh, a lot more credibility than they have these days because we have four, at least four champions in each weight division. The sensation is too much for the Scots in the audience who raid the ring to congratulate the new world champion. Listen to the row. My teacher actually read a bit out of the paper. Scotland has its first ever world champion, and his name is Benny Lynch. And I can remember to this day, he said he won it in a big fight, and he defeated an Englishman, and we should all be very proud of this man. I was fascinated by the fact that he was only five foot three. I mean, I was about four foot nine, but the fact that he wasn't a, a giant, but was the world champion. I mean, if you just look back to the man, his chest measurement was 33, his waist was 26, he was five feet three high and he weighed eight stone. Now, we are talking about a 12-year-old child nowadays, a flyweight at eight stone, and several of the world's great referees have said that he punched welterweight. That's like saying a middleweight punched heavyweight. You really must have enormous power. His wrists were so small, you couldn't believe it. Five feet and a half inch and thin arm, thin leg. But he was as strong as a horse. At that time, every kid, if you were interested in boxing, you wanted to be Benny Lynch. You know, that, that was the boxer you wanted to be. He would be as big as Prince Nazim Hamid is now, uh, and a better fighter as well. Uh, but that would be the scale you're looking at. I mean, he would be fighting in arenas. He'd be, fight, he'd be fighting in satellite TV, you know, broadcast live to the USA. In fact, he'd probably be fighting in the USA because he's so good. An instant star. Every Scot wanted to toast their new champion. On his return to Glasgow Central Station, a hundred thousand people lined the streets to hail their conquering hero. The city celebrated like never before. The king and the queen never got a better reception uh, and Scotland where Lynch got. From Central Station, right over to the south side of Glasgow, where Benny came from, the streets were all covered with flags, flowers, and thousands of people. Benny sitting in an open deck car in the back and waving out and bowing to people. It was unbelievable. There was a suggestion, of course, that the city council give him some kind of welcome. They refused. The city fathers didn't even give him a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Glasgow Corporation said, no, we don't want to know. Our first ever world champion. The indifference of the city fathers was in marked contrast to the newsreels, whose cameramen were dispatched to cover Benny's every move. Benny plays golf. He also indulges in a fast and furious game of ping pong. So fast it makes the spectators dizzy. This is a very glamorous guy, you know. I mean, he loves clothes, he dresses brilliantly, cars. But what was a surprise to me was what a glamorous city Glasgow was at the time. Between music halls, nightclubs, dancing, cinema, restaurants, all the images, all the places that uh, he tended to go. There's, there's a fabulous air of glamour and excitement just about the whole city at the time, which is a real contrast to the poverty that was, you know, equally apparent at the time. Now married to Annie, his dance hall sweetheart, Benny left his Gorbo's home. His winnings allowed him to buy a house in Burnside, one of the city's more affluent suburbs. He lived down at Gloucester Avenue there. I, I don't remember the exact house, it was a long time ago, but it was definitely in Gloucester Avenue that he stayed. <laughs> he moved up here in the, the mid-1930s, and these houses were just built about 1935 and they, they cost 500 pounds. <laughs> McDonald's family fives, 500 pounds for a five apartment semi. <laughs> and they must have, I suppose, had one or two successful fights and made a little money and moved up here. Up north, meet British and world flyweight champion, Benny Lynch, in training to defend his titles on September the 16th at Glasgow's Shawfield Park against Southern champion, Pat Palmer. Benny believes in hard training for a hard fighter. Fueling all this fame and celebrity were Lynch's successes in the ring, and his world title fights brought a buzz to the city. He attracted crowds of 40,000 to see him box at open air shows at Shawfield Stadium. You know, you couldn't get 40,000 people at Shawfield to watch football now. A 15 Dream Crown Contest for the Flyweight Championship of Great Britain, Europe, and the world. 
It may have been the height of the Depression, but the people of Glasgow forgot their worries and reveled in the glory of their very own world beater. Lynch ruled the ring ruthlessly and doled out boxing lessons to anyone who dared challenge him. He may have been small, but everybody wanted a piece of Benny. This is the very beginning of celebrity culture in the United Kingdom, in sporting circles, certainly. Well, this is uh, Will Fife and two other great Scotchmen here. There's Alec James and Benny Lynch. Oh, baby, what I couldn't do with plenty of money and you In spite of the worries that money brings Just a little filthy lucre buys a lot of things And I could take you to places you'd like to go But outside of them, I know you Always with an eye on the bottom line, it was the makers of Scotland's other national drink who recognised the value in having Lynch endorse their strengthening beverage. The money was rolling in. Now he had wealth. That meant he could go drinking every night of the week because he now had, he was flush with money. He liked to drink, he liked to drink far too much. Everyone wanted to say, I know Benny Lynch. I bought Benny Lynch a drink, or more likely Benny Lynch bought me a drink, as he did. He, he bought everyone a drink. He bought entire pubs a drink. Benny they used to come out and all the kids used to come running down because Benny would throw money to us. Uh, six mizzies and dropping the pieces and that. Well, to us that was a fortune at that time. He wasn't stingy with his money. He'd help anyone. You come and tap on his he look up skin with no money. He gave you some money. He was spending money left, right and centre. I could take you to places that you would like to. Annie, his wife, told me the story that she had to get to the state that where she could never, ever say to him, oh, I would love this or I would love that, because if he heard that she wanted anything, he just went out and bought it. If she said she wanted a fur coat, he would go out and buy a fur coat. If she wanted a new suite of furniture, he just went out and bought it. He had no conception of management of money. Oh, baby, what I couldn't do with plenty of money and you well, you tend to find that not too many accountants take up boxing, uh, and there's never a shortage of people who are willing to part them from their money. And boxers are, by and large, notoriously poor with their money. When you look at Mike Tyson now, who's allegedly $37 million in debt to the Inland Revenue in America, and uh, that, that's something that's not going to change, I don't think. Money and you. Amongst the world's flyweights, Lynch was peerless. And if one fight proved this, it was the extraordinary 1937 title defence against a future world champion, 19-year-old Peter Kane. It was a sellout fight at Shawfield Stadium. And to the delight of the crowd, a touch of Hollywood glamour was added to the evening in the shape of Oscar-winning actor Victor McLaughlin, who turned up and took a bow before the first bell. Then battle commences, and Peter Kane is promptly socked by champion Benny Lynch. But little things like that don't worry Kane. As he settles down, he forces Lynch back, and time and again he attacks with brilliantly timed punches to the body to set the crowd roaring. Kane was a very, very good fighter, but Lynch was brilliant that night. Kane was terrific, outstanding, but he just met Lynch at his best that night. And having cleverly fought his way through the whirlwind tactics of his opponent, he reaches the twelfth round, complete master of the situation. He boxed wonderful. Not fighting, not just boxing, parrying, shitting, ducking, weaving, making him miss. And he boxed perfect. It was a right wonderful fight. And now Lynch begins the battering process. Slowly the life ebbs out of Kane's attack. Slowly his punches lose their bite. Kane is reeling. He can't hold out. It'll be a knockout. But the gong saves him. Then the 13th and last round. The champion goes for the kill. Kane's defense has almost disappeared. He's reeling again. Lynch has got him. Kane is down. You'd think Peter had had enough by now, but after a count of seven, he tries to carry on the fight. It's impossible, of course. Lynch's gloves are flying, raining punches like hail, a hurricane of punishment. Down again. And for the first time in his life, 19-year-old Peter Kane hears himself counted out. On the 13th day of the month, in the 13th round at precisely 10.13. Knockouts were a clear sign of his power, but Lynch was a supreme stylist and a complete boxer. Starts like a bullet, walks across, lands the right hand, left hook, whoa, drops him like stone with that left hook. And I love the way he moves his head to avoid his opponent's counters. He 
was a wicked puncher. He put everything into his shots. It comes up close to him and it's the wrong place to be with Lynch. He was really good on the inside. Could chop you to pieces. Looks like he's throwing wild punches, but they're all carefully calculated. He knows what he's doing. Fighters today could even pick up tips from him. On the inside, it was really good. Look, bringing the shot round up the middle, round the side. Again, his stance is unique too. Bounces back, lands the right hand. He used to parry punches with his hands. It was great the way he blocked punches and turned his head down. Brings the left hook up the middle. It's fantastic stuff. You know, watch him turn to the body there. That's the impressive thing. After 12 furious rounds, he decides in the 13th round, I'm going to hit him to the body. Watch again. Body shot, bringing him up the middle. All of these things are still used today. Incredible technique, and this is the end of the fight. You can see it here. No doubt about it. It can really hurt his opponent, take him out. Deadly finisher. Unbelievable. Born into the Gorbos in Glasgow's south side in 1913, just prior to the First World War, Benny Lynch grew up in an era when boxing was thriving, rivaled only in its popularity by football. For Benny, boxing was just about the only opportunity to escape a difficult childhood. The Lynch's were a very poor family. He had his father, his brother James, his mother and himself. But unfortunately, his mother had quite a few boyfriends. Mum left dad and uh, was taken in, as people were at the time, by friends or aunts or uncles, the extended family syndrome. Uh, nowadays, they'd be taken into care by the social work department, but in those days, it was friends and relatives that took over. Winning his first boxing honour at the age of eight, Benny was encouraged to take up boxing by a local priest, Father Fletcher. He showed great promise, which was noted by Sammy Wilson, local bookmaker and a former boxer himself. Sammy Wilson noted how good this young lad was as an amateur boxer, and he took him under his wing, told him that he could make it as a professional, told him he could make it as a world champion. It became a, like a father and son relationship, very close they were together. A way of supplementing his meagre winnings from his early fights was to take on all comers in the boxing booths at travelling fairgrounds, where Lynch's eccentric style soon singled him out. The crowd used to whistle, Pop Goes the Weasel, and that was a popular tune at the time. They whistled that because he had such an unusual dancing technique. This was the way this man kept moving around all the time. The boxing was a farce. They weren't genuine fights. It was just a sparring session, anyway. You know, there were no verdicts come in. Just if you went in the distance, you got your money. It was three rounds you did in those days. You know, you get a battle that was so pound if you're still on your feet after the first round. Still on your feet after the second round, you get about two pounds, and, and after the third round, you're still on your feet, you won about five pounds, which was quite a bit of money in those days. They would travel around in the booze to earn money, and that toughened them up, and that helps develop skills, I think. Uh, thankfully, young boxers don't have to do that anymore. The booths have long gone, but the effort required of today's boxers to match the success of Lynch is as demanding as it ever was. There is no sport harder than boxing. The footballers can sit back in the back wing, take a breather. We take a breather, we get knocked out. It's as simple as that. There's no breather in that ring. Boxing's a very, very hard game. People don't realise how hard boxing is. The training you've got to do, and the rigorous way you've got to adopt your living, eating, drinking and all that. See, most people at ringside, they don't see the six or eight weeks before it. You're out on the roads every morning. You're in the gym every night, sparring. You're in the weekend. You get about one night a week off. No matter how disciplined you are, Suddenly the alarm goes off at six o'clock in the morning and it's windy and rainy and oh no. Gotta get up and do my road work. Gotta go to the same old sweaty gym every day and take the punches in the head just like I had before when I was working my way towards the top. The hardest part is at the weekends, all your mates are going out and they're egging you on to go out and you've got to say, no, oh, I can't go, you've got to go in early. Have your early nights. What people don't seem to understand is the effort it actually takes to get up there is, is so onerous on your body and so tough and physically demanding that guys are sort of half worn out by the time they get up there. If I, if I won a British title, I would be over the moon with that. But uh, to take it on for there, because you obviously don't finish there. If you get to that level, you've obviously got to take it to the world level and get a go. A person will get a go with anybody. It's that much more difficult when you are the champ, when you have something. You don't want it as much, no matter what anybody tells you. The same passion is not there. The desire slightly ebbs away as you, as, you, as you get more money and you get a better quality of life. Lynch's hunger started to wane sooner rather than later. 
Distractions from training were never far away. Benny, unfortunately, was so popular, and there were so many people round about Benny. They knew he had money, so they were always round about Benny, and in for a pint, and Benny was pinting up and drinking up. And that's one thing you can't do in boxing, is misbehave yourself and still expect to be a top. More drinking and less training in the run-up to the rematch with Peter Kane pointed to an erosion of Lynch's supreme ring craft. Lynch isn't his usual brilliant self. At the weigh-in, he was one pound seven ounces over the stipulated eight stone six, had to forfeit a hundred pounds. But though he's a Scot, that doesn't make any difference. He was lucky to get a draw. <laughs> he was beat from here to hell and back, but so he got a draw. Different man altogether. And then there's sensation, when the referee raises the arms of both men to indicate a draw. Some of the crowd have other ideas. Because of the weight that he had to fight at, he was forced to continually diet. And I think there's a whole regimen of training, training, training to get down to his weight, you know, fighting successfully, and then rewarding himself with, you know, with food and drink and so on. And ultimately, that's a very punishing cycle. When he wasn't training, he was drinking, and the weight just used to fly on. I've seen him come down from 11 stone to 8 stone, 7 stone 13 and 3 quarters. Six weeks. Lovely. And fit as a fiddle. But as he got older and he was drinking a bit more, things got harder. A series of defeats and lacklustre performances in non title fights was to prove Lynch's undoing when it came to his next world title defence. There was a series of, of fights when he, he turned up overweight. Uh, one of them was the Jackie Jurek, which was a tremendous sensation in, in Glasgow because here he was supposed to be defending his world title and he couldn't even make the weight. Tragedy in the ring. And you can hear what the Scotsman among the 12,000 think about the big fight. Before the first toe has touched the floor, three years world flyweight champion Benny Lynch has lost his title. I had the belief that he would make the weight because he always got down to it. But in this time, we just took things too like a day to go, and uh, events overcome him. It's hard luck on Benny. He turned the scales at six and a half pounds overweight, and now he'll never again be able to fight as a flyweight. Well, that was a turning point because he lost it in the scales before the fight began. He was six and a half pounds overweight, which for a flyweight is just incredible uh, how that could ever be allowed to happen. Uh, so he was stripped of his title before the fight started. The fight went ahead. I think he probably well, vented his frustration on Jurek. Seven times the young American goes down. Enough punishment to knock out a man twice his weight. There was no coming back for him after that. Uh, and that really was the beginning of the end for Benny Lynch. Lynch lands one to the stomach and it's all over with Jurek. So Lynch is still one of Britain's greatest boxers and Jurek becomes number one contender for the world title. He loses the title because he's overweight. But he goes on to win the fight. And that's a very... Uh, it's a very evocative moment, you know, it's a very powerful moment that I think would speak again to a lot of us in that, you know, the way we all struggle to control our lives, to, to in some way shape our lives. Although no longer world champion, the people of Glasgow were still prepared to forgive their wayward hero. He was adored by the people in Glasgow, and I mean that. He always, always got to him. Come on, Benny, I'll buy you a drink. No, no, I'll buy you one. And then before you know where you are, he's drinking as much as them. A couple of hours later, he's still at it. Great guy to be with. Full of laughs. Like the joke. Bit of fun. He used to go into the car and every Saturday night, dancing. Drunk as a lot, but still going to dance. <laughs> he was a great character. However, opinion is divided as to the reasons behind Lynch's unstoppable decline. This idea that Benny Lynch was, you know, a very sort of generous figure who was brought down by hangers-on, um, I, I do think that's a myth, you know. It doesn't explain his, his end to me. It doesn't explain his alcoholism to me, you know. Um, I think the, the place to look is the early part of his life, you know. I think this is a much more internal struggle and, and quite a spiritual struggle for this guy. Anyone who saw him box knew he had brains. He was sensible enough to avoid that, and he, he didn't. I often wondered why. He had a nice home, he had a bungalow on Burnside, a wife and two kids, and he had everything to fight for, and yet I got to push it back to his own background and his own upbringing. His father was always drunk, <laughs> so was his mother for that matter. It was just a way of life for them. It was a hard job, Lynch. Maybe under different circumstances, he may have, may have done better, I don't know. 
Uh, this was one of these unfortunate chaps that was mixing with bad company. Company uh, dr taking drink off him and Ben was drinking a wee bit weak wool that way. By the time he fought at the heavier bantamweight, Lynch's increasing weight was far less a problem than his inability to remain sober in and outside the ring. Benny Lynch fights Oral Turner, Dark Trunks. Tonight he is to prove Benny Lynch is down for and is doing all the attacking while the Scot hardly seems interested. There he was, hopelessly drunk for days before it, hopelessly drunk on the train down to London to take part in the fight at the Empress Hall down there. He even had drink in the dressing room. He had a bottle of his favourite whisky, Crawford's liqueur whisky, wrapped up in a towel in his dressing room. In the third round, Turner lands a knockout, the first that Lynch has ever suffered. There's certainly no doubt about it, his crisis is over. I was a farce of it, I think It wasn't Ben Lynch. Any boxing man could see it coming, you knew. It had to come sometime. For Lynch, once a great champion, it's a sad exit tonight. For Oral Turner, it's a gay one. That was the first time Benny Lynch had ever been knocked out. It was the last time, because it was his last fight. The National Sporting Club were well aware of Lynch's drinking. They even booked him into a clinic to tackle his alcoholism. But Lynch did not respond well to the treatment. Exasperated at his repeated failure to make the required weight, and now his apparent unwillingness to confront his drinking, led the boxing authorities to first suspend and then revoke Lynch's boxing licence. To my mind, he, he, the British Board of Boxing Control were extremely unforgiving. Even given the time, there seemed to be very, very little appreciation of the fact that this was a man battling uh, with a very cruel addiction. There's a very clear class issue that this is a young fighter from Glasgow, you know, from an, an immigrant family, um, dealing with really, you know, the, the aristocracy um, who ran, you know, the higher echelons of boxing at the time. With the help of close friends, Lynch tried to quit the booze again. This time at a monastery in Northern Ireland, where he even managed to dry out. But on his return to Glasgow... It was back to the same old friends. There's Benny, I want to be seen with Benny, or I want to buy Benny a drink. Only 26 and bloated with drink, Lynch returned to the boxing booths in a vain attempt to win back his licence. However, the money he earned there was never enough to feed his uncontrollable addiction. His money started disappearing. You've got to remember that in total, Benny earned about between 30 and 40 thousand pounds, which would be the equivalent in today's terms of something around three quarters of a million to a million pounds. He came to the fight and he just pulled his pockets empty. And I started slinging money all angles. Amazing, huh? Somebody must have made a lot of money on it because he never got it all. As his relationship with the bottle grew, Lynch's personal life disintegrated and the downward spiral of self-destruction neared its end, when in August 1946, Benny Lynch was admitted to Glasgow's Southern General Hospital, malnourished and feverish. I mean, I've seen Benny just before he died. He had cried. How you knew he had cried. He walked in the hospital and just told him, I'm going to die. They told him he's going to die. Right? I'm Benny Lynch. I'm sick. I'm going to die. Oh, Ben is wonderful. In death, he finally found release from alcoholism. But the manner of his downfall should never deny Benny Lynch his rightful place amongst the stars of world boxing. Then battle commences. The thrill of the night is on. Both men are hitting for all their worth. For the next few rounds, it's a splendid stand-up ding-dong struggle. And now Lynch begins the battering process. Lynch comes out fighting mad. And now comes the round that proves to be the last. Lynch's gloves are flying, raining punches like hail, a hurricane of punishment. And Lynch lands his rights and left with an almost sickening monotony. It'll be a knockout. 